The title of today's sermon is How to Make Satan Happy. I'm going to make a statement, yeah, and just cheer based on if you agree or not, yeah? How to make God happy, yeah? Okay, how to make Satan happy? Good, okay, see, so it's obvious that as children of God, as followers of Jesus, that you do not desire to make Satan happy. That's not your desire. You don't wake up in the morning and think, hmm, how might I please the devil? That's not what any of you are doing. And if that is what you are doing, I have a different sermon called the gospel, which you need to hear and come and see me after that. So it's clear that none of you want to make Satan happy, right? But I think it's fair to say that during the course of your life, during the course of your Christian walk, there have been times when you have made Satan happy. Even though that was in your goal, you may have done things which Satan was pleased with even though that wasn't your intention, even though that wasn't what you were trying to do. And so that's why I think it's important today to look at some of the ways in which we might be making Satan happy, unknowingly. And if we are, then we would stop, isn't it? Because by the booze, I'm guessing none of you want to make Satan happy, right? No, you don't, do you? Actually, let me not assume. Hands up if you would like to make Satan happy. Okay, just for those at home, no, nobody's hands went up, All right? Okay, so, so you see the passage that we're looking at. It says that Jesus was talking to those who believed, right? So, and then so it said to the Jews who believed, he said to them, you know, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, we all accept that and we all know that as followers of Jesus, we have been set free, that he died to set us free. But they answered him, Oh, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves. How can you say that we shall be set free? So they claim to follow Jesus and don't know that they need to be set free from sin. And even another lie, they said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves. Egypt? Pharaoh? Did that happen? So they're not even fully up on their history. Because slaverily speaking, you have been slaves. And spiritually speaking, you are slaves. Now, I I laid that down as a platform to show that as believers or as people who claim to follow Jesus, it is possible to be misinformed. It is possible to be doing something which we believe is good and it's not. As Paul says, when Paul was persecuting the church, he believed he was doing the will of God. So uh, Paul wasn't thinking, I hate God he believed he was doing the will of God. And he was doing it fervently until Jesus stepped in and says, why are you persecuting me? It's possible to unintentionally please Satan, to make the devil happy. Yeah? So I want to look at four possible ways in which we may be doing this. Yeah? Or which we may have done it in the past and make sure we don't do it again. Yeah? So, so the first way is having an unmovable commitment to safety and comfort. Yeah, so when, as far as we're concerned, our safety and our comfort are the top priorities in life. And nothing or anyone will get in the way of that. We will do any and everything as long as it does not compromise our safety or our comfort. So we see here in Matthew 16, so it says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And so Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him, because why not? Never, Lord, he said, that shall never happen to you. And then Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And we see here Jesus equates prioritizing human concerns over the concerns of God akin to Satan. Because clearly, Peter isn't thinking, I hate Jesus and I want to get in his way. He is concerned about the safety and the comfort of his friend. He cares. And there is nothing wrong with being concerned 
about the safety and comfort of our loved ones and ourselves. There is nothing wrong with that. If you weren't concerned about your safety and comfort, you probably are not the most aware person of life and reality. But the problem comes when we place our safety and comfort over the will of God. Here, Jesus tells Peter, this has to happen. <laughs> I will be doing the will of God. And Peter sees, wait, it involves suffering and killing. And Peter is so taken aback by the suffering and killing part that he misses, but on the third day I'll be raised to life. Sometimes we are so committed to comfort, we are so committed to not suffering that we only see the danger and don't see the blessing within that. We only see the risk and don't see the blessing of obedience that will come with us taking the act of faith. And when we prioritize our own safety and comfort over the will of God, we are making Satan extremely happy. And the reason why we can justify it, because, you know, that thing is dangerous. Who wants to suffer? That's not wise. There are so many clever ways in which we can use safety and comfort to disobey God and not feel bad about it. To disobey God and call it wisdom. To disobey God and call it an act of love. And there is nothing wrong with desiring comfort. But we must never place our comfort, our safety, above the will of God. And when we're doing that, we make Satan happy. Another way we might make Satan happy is when we, when we misunderstand God's word. Yeah? So, in Genesis, now you all know the story of um, Satan um, tempting Adam and Eve. Now, let's look at it. So, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than the other wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Now, this was her response. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Now, is that what God said? Let's see what God said. So, and then the serpent said, the serpent said you know, you will not die. But now let's see what God says. Earlier, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are to eat you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you eat from it, you will die. Where is the part in there about touching it? God never said you can't touch it. He said, can't eat from it. He never said you can't touch it. Now, Eve clearly has misunderstood this and thinks the command isn't just don't eat it, but also to touch it, right? So when Satan says to her, that's not true, you won't die, yeah? So if Eve believes touching the tree will bring death, as God has says, and she touches the fruit and doesn't die, what does she now believe about what God has said? That is not true. That is not true. And do you think Satan was happy about that? Of course he was. Satan is extremely pleased when we misunderstand God's word. Because when we misunderstand God's word, we will misapply God's word. And when we ignorantly misapply God's word, we will think we are doing nothing wrong. And we will feel strong in our disobedience. Because as far as we're concerned, we are doing what God said. Also, when we misunderstand God's word, and we disobey our misunderstanding, not what God instructed, we're not properly testing the word of God. We're testing our misunderstanding, which will lead to more misunderstandings about God, his character. Because God said, don't touch it, you will die. I'm touching it and I'm not dying. When we misunderstand God's word, we make Satan extremely happy and you will see in the, in the gospel of Matthew when Satan tempted Jesus 
Jesus only hit back with, let me get this. So Jesus only hit back with, it is written. It is written. It is written. He didn't hit back with, in my opinion. Too often, Christians go to, in my opinion, over, it is written. There are issues on which the Bible is silent. So if the discussion is, shall we extend the roof of the church? Yes, you pray about it and you give your opinion, right? If the instruction is, shall we share the gospel? It is not your opinion. It is written. The sinless son of God came against Satan and did not give his opinion. He gave the word of God. How can sinful fallen me come against Satan with my opinion? We make Satan extremely happy when we misunderstand God's word. Now, the next one. We also make Satan happy when we fail to forgive and restore fallen brothers and sisters. Now, so this is the passage in um, 2 Corinthians. Now, here's a bit of the context of what happened. So, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about an issue that was going on. And the issue was that there was a man who had taken his father's wife. Now, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that he hadn't taken his mother, <laughs> that his father had married someone else, but who knows. But he had taken his father's wife, right? And everybody in the church was kind of ignoring it. So Paul wrote to them and said, what are you guys doing? Deal with that sin. Discipline him. Discipline him. In order that he might repent. Yeah? And that is always the purpose of God's discipline. Is to bring us repentance. It's never to cause our destruction. It's never to make us broken and torn down and destroyed. Whenever God disciplines us, it's to correct us and bring us on the right path. Whenever God disciplines us, it's because we have strayed away and he wants to bring us back onto the right path. This brother had strayed away and rather than the body of Christ bringing him onto the right path, they were ignoring the sin. So Paul said, nope, deal with it. So they dealt with it. They disciplined him, kicked him out of the church. But then he repented. And after he repented, nothing had happened. So Paul has to write to them again and says, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You started well. There was sin identified, dealt with. Now there's been repentance. There must be restoration. They hadn't completed the journey. They had only started it. And Paul has to write to them, because if you leave this brother on his own, in his sorrow, he is vulnerable to Satan. He's the lost sheep away from the flock out in the wilderness where ravenous wolves can get to him, where he will be crushed by sorrow. And him being part of the body of Christ, Paul says, no, 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 go and get him. He's repented. Bring him back in, comfort and restore him because the purpose of the discipline was restoration. So you must complete it. When brothers and sisters, when we fall, we must be disciplined. When we repent, we must be restored. And when we don't do that, when we leave that person out in the wilderness, Satan is extremely glad. And finally, the thing that I think makes Satan the most happiest that makes him do the Michael Jackson and Billie Jean dance is when we give up on our relationship with God. So you see here in Job, when um, after, uh, you know, afflicting Job, 
Satan then, you know, says, this is the conversation between Satan and the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Satan says, skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will curse you to your face. Satan is extremely happy and pleased when we allow the difficulties and trials of life to cause us to give up on our relationship with the Lord. When you walk away, when you think one trial, two trials, three trials, 10 trials, 100 trials, this is too much, forget it. Satan is pleased. He is happy that you are walking away from the most important thing in the universe. That you are walking away from the most important thing you have. And it's really interesting because sometimes our willingness to walk away from our relationship with God as a result of suffering is evidence of how much we valued God in the first place. Because in all my years of living, I have never encountered anyone. Now, bear this in mind. I've encountered many people who have walked away from the Lord because of suffering, because things didn't go their way. I have never, not once, encountered anyone who says, because of all the suffering I'm going through, because of all the consecutive pain, strife I am going through, I am going to give up on money. No one. Nobody ever allows suffering, hardship, death of family members, trials, tribulations, sickness, to cause them to give up on money. Because no matter what happens to them, they believe that money is still valuable. They believe that money is still vital to their success and happiness. And so if trials and tribulations is now tempting you to walk away from God, what did you believe about God in the first place? And why are you not giving up on money? Satan is deeply pleased. Satan is overjoyed if you allow the sufferings, the difficulties, the trials that you are facing, if you allow them to take you away from the Lord. And if you do allow it to take you away from the Lord, then as far as Satan is concerned, mission accomplished. And we are not here to help Satan accomplish his mission. We are here to help the Lord accomplish his mission. So as believers, it is our goal and our desire to please the Lord. And we do not desire under any circumstances to make Satan happy. And because that is the case, always remember to put obedience over safety and comfort. Remember to get a good understanding of God's word so that you can have a good application of God's word. Forgive and restore those who have fallen so that Satan will not outwit us. And then, because we do not want to make Satan happy, because it's our desire to please the Lord, we do not give up on our relationship with God under any circumstances. We are more committed to God than the unbeliever is committed to money because he is our treasure. 